I'm Harvard Sexaholic. Hey, uh, good morning. <laughs> Part of me wants to rebel and say the heck with this form. Yes, I hate taking directions, but we need to go according to the form. Uh, it says, will you please join me in this session with the serenity prayer? God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and will lose the no difference. In the spirit of the fifth tradition to carry the message, this session will be recorded. The recorder will not be turned off during this session. If you do not wish to be recorded, you may participate by listening or attend another session. We ask that those who choose to share (coughs) step up to the microphone so that those who listen to the recording can follow the discussion. Uh, (coughs) My name is Harvey Asher. I'm a sexaholic, and I've been sexually sober uh, for 25 years and 10 months. Uh, The essay purpose, um, Sexaholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop lusting and become sexually sober. There are no dues or fees for SA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. SA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution, does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sexually sober and help others to achieve sexual sobriety. Okay. Uh, Excuse me, I... I need to stand by the microphone, and it's not my usual approach. I'm usually dancing all over the front of the room, so I I feel a bit restrained, but maybe that's the message God is giving me today. Um, I'm going to talk about a topic that um, I think Roy's uh, death has really brought to the surface for me, because with him gone, it's almost, it seems incumbent upon all of us to emphasize what he, I think, took for granted from his own inspiration. I think he was so inspired when he wrote this, what became the book, which is he, when he wrote different articles, um, and they finally put it into a book form. He was so inspired that I think he thought we understood what he meant. And over the years, in looking at what he subsequently tried to do, I think it was hard for him to understand why people weren't getting it. But I don't think we ever understood what he already knew. And what that is, is that this program is not about sexually acting out. This program is about lust. It does not say we are powerless over sexually acting out. Other fellowships say we are powerless over our sexual behavior. We have no mention of that in step one. It says we are powerless over lust. And yet, if you sit at lots of meetings, which I have over the years in all kinds of places and all kinds of countries, and the emphasis seems to always be on the sexually acting out. 
on when did I masturbate last? When did I uh, make that obscene phone call or call someone or, or go on the Internet? It's always about the behavior And it's seldom about the lust. You know, I I was reviewing the book recently and going through it again. And it just kind of startled me that in the preface of the book, in the preface, in the first sentence, it, it says... This book is for those who want to stop their sexually self-destructive thinking and behavior. And if you read that on and you keep reading and you read the chapter on lust, you get to see that Roy hardly talked about the sexual acting out. Roy kept talking about the fantasy and the memories and what goes on in here. You know, he even goes on to say that although the temptations never go away, The obsession does. So the behavior will go away. But what goes on in our brain doesn't. And yet, lust is the driving force of our sexual acting out. That's what he writes. Lust is the driving force. Masturbation is the result of the lust. It is not the lust. You know, turning on the internet to look at pornography is not the lust. It's what happened before you typed in those words. Man, this program for years has been emphasizing something That is not the emphasis. <laughs> and we wonder why people keep relapsing. Well, in my opinion, they keep relapsing because they never have gotten sober. They stopped some acting out, but the acting in continues. And then it's the driving force that leads to the acting out again. So what are we talking about when it comes to the the text that this is based on? The AA book. We're talking about the doctor's opinion, which will be followed up in subsequent talks here. Think in, even in right in this room. <coughs> We're talking about a physical allergy accompanied by a mental obsession. The masturbation isn't the allergy necessarily. It's part of the allergy. The internet is not the allergy by itself. It could be part of the allergy. The allergy is the thought that turns into a fantasy that begins the process of craving, the phenomenon of craving. And once that phenomenon sets in, God himself would have trouble stopping it. You know, in AA they talk, they say, God is so omniscient. He is so omnipresent, so powerful, uh, so omnipotent that if an alcoholic in recovery takes an open bottle of alcohol and puts it up to his lips, 
that God is so powerful, he could knock that bottle right out. But statistically, he doesn't do that. Okay. So, it is possible, I would imagine, that while, and for the guys especially, while urinating, you could stop it in midstream. That God could help you stop it in midstream. But I wish you well. <laughs> Try to stop urinating in midstream. Even though not only will it hurt, it's, it's hard to do. And that's what we expect when you're in the middle of a fantasy. Oh, just a little bit more I could think this one. I could let the motion picture go just a little bit longer. I wish you well. If you could fantasize like a gentleman, my hat's off to you. I cannot fantasize like a gentleman. Because I have a damaged brain. It is no different for me to try to stop midstream as it would be for me to try to stop a fantasy midstream. And for those who have been coming in a bit, I just want to review that this This talk is about, to me, what is the true essence of this fellowship. That the true essence is not about not acting out. It's about acting in. It's about what is lust. And are you allergic to lust or not? It's that simple question. I am so ill that I cannot have a sexual fantasy. I am so ill that I cannot even replay the next day what happened in our marital bed. I cannot do anything in my head successfully when it comes to sex. That's how sick I am. And for those of you who aren't as sick, go for it. If you could do it, fine. I have not been impressed with people being able to do it successfully. I mean, our relapse rate is Dramatic. And how does it happen? How do people start masturbating again? Or start going to the prostitutes and knowing they're going to get a venereal disease or it's going to cost them a lot of money or it's going to do this and do that. How does it come back? We're not dumb. I mean, Majority of us, pretty bright people, or we wouldn't have been able to juggle those balls for so long, for so well. How does it happen? It happens because once the phenomenon of craving sets in, we cannot stop it. We cannot stop it. And so this whole talk is about what goes on in the head And how do we utilize the tools of the program? Roy says very clearly, we cannot get anyone sober. We can't get people sober. We could just help them stay sober. Okay. Let's talk a little about lust. Ah. What the hell is lust? 
you know, this bull stuff, you know, we have all these words, you know, surrender. Yeah, what the hell surrender? Define it for me. I mean, how do you define lust? How do you define surrender? How do you f- define being sober? You know, all this, these words, they are just words. They're like talking about what is God. You know, how the heck do you define this stuff and share it and talk about it with words? Because God is not something you can figure out. God is something you experience. Lust is not something you can figure out. Lust is something you experience. It is not lust when you're masturbating, necessarily. That's endorphins, heroin, whatever it is. It's part of the powerless craving cycle. But what is lust? And by the way, we can't even define masturbation in this fellowship. You get a group of guys and say, what do you mean by masturbation? My God, my hair stands on edge sometimes. Waterboarding is nothing compared to what people on this program do to themselves to avoid saying this is masturbation. (laughs) I'd rather be waterboarded than having to prevent an orgasm when you're, try, you're touching yourself. And guys in this program will do that. They'll spend hours stimulating themselves, but I didn't go to orgasm. I'm sober today. <laughs> or they'll stand in front of, sit in front of their computer aroused for hours If, if that's not self-abuse, what it is, as they used to call it in, in the old textbooks. So we have difficulty defining words. But Roy gave us some light into this about lust. He said lust is an attitude, a natural attitude that gets perverted to unnatural Desires. By the way, check out whatever I say. I still lie. I make stories up. I say things are in books that don't even exist. Be so careful what I tell you. I convince myself I'm telling the truth. I mean... I, I, I laugh about it. I say things so enthusiastically that I begin to believe them. <laughs> I made all this up, by the way. When I <laughs> um, so, all kidding aside, I think Roy was so inspired that he understood what he meant by lust. And that somewhere along the way, we got so preoccupied about not masturbating or not acting out that we forget that it's about being powerless over lust. I've told a few people this this week, but uh, about three years ago or whenever the Baltimore conference was, um, Roy had left a meet, some meetings and he was standing outside and I walked out. I was there and I went up to him and I said, Roy, you know, I'm working on stuff of what is sex with self and I'm writing some things. And Roy, why is it so vague? What is sex with self? Why is it so vague in the, in the book? And he looked at me like, you know, what are you talking about? Yeah. And I said, you know, it, sex with self could be almost anything. And he said, uh, why didn't you just say what you meant? 
about it. And he looked at me and he said, um, no, Harvey, you're talking about a religion dotting every eye. This isn't a religion. You know, we can't define this stuff for you. Oh, some obvious things if you're going to have an orgasm or something. And, and uh, you know. But even then, some guys will be writing their first step. And get to something they had done in the past. And without them knowing it, they get so excited they have a spontaneous ejaculation. Is that sex with self? No. So he was right. You can't dot every I. It's difficult about it. You know, that guy would have to define it for, you know, somehow what was his motive, what was he doing, did he purposely do, you know. And then you have the reverse, the guy who's letting himself try to have a, an arousal for hours watching the computer and then saying it wasn't masturbation. So it's to thine self, own self be true. And therefore, with lust, to thine own self be true. What is lust to you? What is that attitude? Well, the attitude I hear so often is, oh, compared to what I used to do, oh, what's, what's having that little thought about that attractive woman? Harvey, what's so bad if I'm thinking about if my wife dies and that woman smiles at me, you know, why not marrying her in my mind? (laughs) By the way, I've never had that thought. (laughs) I just lied again. See how it goes? And that's another topic completely about our hallucinations. You know, we are insane. I don't know about you. You might be saying, I'm insane. I ho- Insanity has hallucinations and delusions associated with it. And if a woman says hello to me, I get an auditory hallucination. I hear her say, let's have sex. <laughs> I get visual hallucinations for years in the program. It hasn't happened for a while. Today it will happen, I'm sure, since I'm saying it. But um, uh, people will be dressed and I'll see their vaginas and their penises. They'll be dressed. I get visual hallucinations. Guys, people will show up in the shower with me out of nowhere. Other people will show up in bed with me. me. I mean, where the hell does this crap come from? Well, they're visual hallucinations. I get another part of insanity, delusional thinking. And I get delusional thinking. You know, um, hey, they don't like me, or they're after me, or they're going to get me, or, you know, uh, or I need to look good to my sponsor. You know, just distortions of reality. And so here we have this insanity that is all duff, integrated with our attitude of lust where people have this delusional thinking. Hey, that little thought isn't going to be a problem. Well, I wish you well. But I don't permit in my life motion pictures in my head. I'm too sick to have a motion picture. I can't afford it. If I want what this program's about. By the way, this program is not about the awfulness of lust and the awfulness of masturbation and sexually acting out. This program's about comfort. 
How do we become comfortable? If you don't get what Roy talks about, a positive sobriety, I wish you well. But it's going to be hard staying sober if you're not comfortable. There's nothing feels so good while you're doing it as acting out. I mean, my God, the rush, the going down, walking or running or driving to think you're even going to act out. I mean, man, the rush, the heroin that shoots in your body. Well, the brain doesn't want, <coughs> want to let go of that unless it has something better or as good. You know? And so when it comes to lust in the motion picture, and what happened, and how does this happen in our program, even though the whole beginning of the book is about the preface You know, the first sentence, as we said, says, want to stop their sexually destructive thinking and behavior. It's almost like the behavior is an afterthought. It's the thinking. And then he says, what is true sobriety? I mean, it's written everywhere. We hear it day after day at meetings when we read it. True sobriety is so what the hell does that mean? <laughs> How often you say it, you don't even, if you're like me, you don't even hear it when it's said. Well, what is it? It's all of a sudden he goes from the definition of sobriety, where you talk about behaviors, And then he says, but per true sobriety, he brings in lust. Wow. And you know, you'll experience it here. You'll be talking to someone and they'll be connected. And all of a sudden they're gone. They're gone. They're still Almost looking at you. Some attractive woman's walk by. In that millisecond, they've already talked to her. They've bedded her down. They've, they're making the second arrangement with her already. <laughs> she's already told them they're the best lovers they've, she's ever had. All while you're talking to the person. That's the lust. What is going on in here? And then what does he do? He tells us in the chapter that's not called overcoming sexually acting out. It says overcoming lust and temptations. <clears throat> and what does he do? And what I say he does, we really don't mean what does he do, meaning Roy. What did somehow this spiritual whatever going through Roy come up on a piece of paper to tell us what to do? This, this is inspired stuff. You know, it's inspired stuff. You know, we're a very fortunate group of people. You know, some people were at Sinai, you know, when the Ten Commandments were given. You know, some people were the original Christians in Rome, you know. Uh, so close to what they felt was their spiritual experience. And we here are so close 
to people who were inspired, like Bill W. Two years sobriety, and he writes a book <laughs> that was unbelievable. You know, and then you get Roy, who gets inspired from AA, and then is able to write some of this stuff. And by the way, these guys have no monopoly on this stuff. All you have to do before you open your mouth when you speak at meetings, and you don't even have to do it and it will still work, is say, God, you speak for me. We're all channels of this divine message. How do I know that? I hear things at meetings. Why the hell am I still going to four or five meetings a week? I hear things that God's talking to me. I was once at this AA meeting and my AA sponsor was in there and this old bum off the street came and he was just a mess. And about a week or two later, My sponsor quotes this guy, what he said. And I said, Cherry, how can you remember this guy was off the street? He was, <clears throat> how do you remember what this guy said weeks later? He said, oh, I don't know who God picks each day to talk to me. So at the meetings. So I have to listen to every word everyone says at the meeting. So here we have this chapter, Overcoming Lust and Temptation. Some of it sounds a little religious to me, by the way. But there's so much in there that you get to pick and choose. I am not a caster out of I can't ca- God, I cast this out for me. I can't do it. It doesn't work for me. What can I tell you? But what works for me that I do morning, noon, and night, hundreds of times a day for years, and now who knows how many times. I use this. It's become not part of my life. It's become my life. God, whatever it is I'm looking for in that woman's butt, may I find in you. God, whatever it is I'm looking for in that guy's bulge in his crotch, may I find in you. God, whatever it is I'm looking for in that thought, may I find in you. God, can you free them from acting out on your lust, please, like you have freed me from acting out on mine today. God, thank you for... Reminding me I'm still sick. Thank you, God, for reminding me I'm still sick. i got to tell you the most embarrassing story. It happened a few months ago. My wife and I, big walkers, and we walked for miles and miles, and I had my iPhone on, my iPod, my iPhone iPod. Okay, and uh, I'm so into these latest sophisticated things here. So, um, I'm a a Broadway show nut. I love theater. And I found a new show. It's an old show, but great music. And I looked at YouTube, at some of the scenes. It was on YouTube. And all of a sudden, on one of the scenes, they're in... um, In Italy, and there's a statue, and she's of a naked guy, you know, one of these temples or something. She's there, and I turn around, but when I turn back, in the song, she was touching him for a second. I photographed that in my mind. It was a Broadway show, and I had turned around in my mind. It was okay. Or I turned around before she touched him, but I filled in the spot, you know, to that statue. I think that's what happened. 
So I tend to avoid that song when it comes up on the tracks. So we're walking and I have my earphones on and I'm either skipping it or it had just started and I, the song where that scene was on the video. And all of a sudden, my wife says to me, Harvey, why are you saying the word penis? <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> well, my earphones were on and I must have, in my mind, knew that that scene, or I saw that scene with, him touch, with her touching his penis And I said, God, whatever it is I'm looking for in that penis, may I find in you? She heard the word penis with my earphones on. Get out of that one, buddies. She said, why why were you saying the word penis? And I said, you know, what? And then I said, from the big book, How It Works, We stood at a turning point. You know what a turning point is. A lot of you all have heard me talk about it. It's that dot that you take a line, you go that way. You come back to that dot and you just go a milli fraction to the right of it. And you put a line up. And even though you can't see the space... Eventually, one line's there, one line's there. Takes you in a totally different direction. And so, I stood at the turning point. What do I say? And I said, oh, Nancy, I saw this video. And she was about to touch his penis. And I made a prayer, whatever it was, about, you know, in that scene. It is penis, may I find in God. She said, oh. (laughs) We went on. To me, it was earth shattering at the moment. To her, oh. Compared to what she's been through getting venereal diseases from me, I guess that's not so bad. My sponsor has always told me, my old sponsor, may he rest in peace, this guy would say, Harvey, lots of people lost respect for me in my disease, but I've never had anyone lose respect for me in my recovery. So here we have tools to use for that first thought. The first thought is on God. That's how I'm made. I'll never be any different. The second thought is on me. Big line from Jess. Jess would say that all the time. By the way, Jess was the first person in this fellowship who ever got up in front of an audience and said, I am lust free today. It's on his recordings. I don't lust today. Why? Well, my attitude is kind of selfish. It's a waste of time. I'm not going to act out today if my ass falls off. (laughs) It doesn't matter if it's Madonna or some guy or who would come up to me. If they want sex today, I'd say, gee, I feel surprised, but by the way, Here's a brochure. (laughs) You talk about delusional thinking when I see a young gal of 20 years old and I'm thinking, gee, she could be my next wife. And then I look in the mirror and realize I'm 70 years old. (laughs) The distortion of reality. Reality. 
So, what happens? What happens is that first thought I call the photograph. And those of you all who work with me and who have meetings with me hear it over and over. I am powerless over that two-dimensional photograph. It just shows up. The moment it shows up, I'm using these automatically. Or we have even a more sophisticated style in Nashville. It's a bag of rubber bands on the wall at our little kind of clubhouse. And a lot of times I wear a rubber band. And just flip it at that first thought. Because I'm not able to have a motion picture successfully. I know it in my heart. I know it. How do I know it, Miss? I know my disease is alive and well. How do I know it? This my dream's always having erotic content to it. Not every dream, but pretty close. <laughs> Somewhere along the dream. Erotica will show up for a moment. But is that lust? Am I going to bed hoping that happens? Oh, God, no. What I have done... I listen to music. I have special uh, uh, things where it goes from one ear to another. So my uh, it's like EMDR for my brain to do things. I'll take a uh, uh, bufferin sometimes. I'll take an antiacid. I'm not trying to have that. That's me. That's there. That will never go away. I'll take it to my grave. I have an incurable, progressive, fatal disease. And if it doesn't kill me physically, it kills me spiritually, emotionally. It kills. And so I choose to use these tools at that photograph. And, you know, my disease gets fed up with me. It just hardly gives me those photographs now. What can I tell you? You know, I talk to my disease all the time. I'm 70 years old. You'd think it, it would be different, but I was taking a shower the other day. And all of a sudden, I felt something happening. You know, excitement a bit. And I said to my disease, if you don't leave me alone, this, I feel it in my body right now. If you don't leave me alone, I'm getting the hell out of this shower right now, even though my hair is all soaked up. (laughs) And it left me alone. This, it knew I get the hell out of the shower. And when I say I'm not going to act out today, if my ass falls off, I want to go further. And this is going to shake you up. This I don't think it's been said or I've never said it, I think, on a tape. There is no reason for me as a sex addict to ever have a, to permit a, a sexual arousal in my pelvic area unless it's to have intercourse with my wife. Meaning, if you wake up with it, that's physiological, go take a leak. You don't have to examine it. You don't have to see if it's grown any overnight. (laughs) You can keep the rulers in the drawer. I guarantee you, it never changes. (laughs) Do you know, if I gave as much energy... To my finger. Gee, I wonder if it's straight enough or long enough. I wonder if it's big enough. I wonder if it's, if that woman likes it enough. They'd lock me up. (laughs) 
I have two people. Me and this other thing. I'm so ill, I can't see it. I put my underwear on under my towel. I do not look at it in a mirror. It is only my friend anymore when I'm intimate with my wife and when I have to urinate. I'm sorry for the gals in the group, but what can I tell you? I haven't had the experience, strength, and hope for the reciprocal part of this. And by the way, we're not prohibitionists. There's nothing evil about my pelvic area. It's the greatest gift God's created. What kind of wonderful creation to think of something like that, my God. <laughs> and to feel so good and figure out how to make, make it happen. I mean, unbelievable, beautiful thing. But for me, I have this disease. Booze is... A great thing too, but not for me. (laughs) And so this isn't done for rigidity, I hope. This is not done for because it's dirty. It's done for my comfort. Because I guarantee you, if I look at myself in the mirror, it's not going to be two minutes later I'm going to look at it again. And then I'm going to want to look at it in a little different form. And then I'm going to want to start comparing it. There's no end. It cannot be satisfied. Lust cannot be satisfied. So, overcoming lust and temptation, it's written here. It tells you how to do it. What is your allergic spot? What is lust to you? I wish I could tell you. I know what it is for me. For me, the attitude is, Harvey, (coughs) look up the movies you're going to go see and make sure there's no nudity or brief nudity in the movie. Guess what? Sometimes I go to movies and there's no nudity or brief nudity and there it is. But that wasn't lust for me. I was not pursuing it. It just happened. You know? What is lust for me when my wife undresses but she's not as modest as I am? You know, uh, this disease is insane. When I'm in heat, I'll go nude anywhere. Anywhere. Anytime, any place. I sober up. I'm the most modest person in the world. And she's not an addict. She doesn't have it. I have to walk out of the room. Or no matter what, I will be powerless. I will touch her butt. I will do something. I am without power. And I'm not ashamed of that today. I'm relieved to know it because my problem today is not knowing I'm sick. It's thinking I'm well. God forbid if I ever believed the this, this stuff I get from these conferences where people think I'm it with I know this and Harvey tell me that. Shoot, you know, I'm working my program the same way you are every day. I get up in the morning, I hit my knees, I do the third step, I give it to God, I immediately make a two-way contract. God, help me not have 
alcohol today and I won't have alcohol and God keep me sexually sober today and I will stay sexually sober today. I was guaranteed if I truly make this contract with God, this covenant with God each morning, this I'm an addict and things only work for one morning. I'm not like these people who could get reborn forever in their life. My rebirth lasts only one day at a time. I can only do it for today. And I make this two-way contract because I was guaranteed that if I make it early in the morning before I could change my mind, that I will truly stay sober that day, even if my ass falls off. By the way, once my front tooth was broken and it came off and my wife said, Harvey, you can't go to a meeting looking that way. You can't. And I said, what can I tell you? And I went to the meeting and uh, it was on Gray Bar at that time for those in Nashville who don't remember the Gray Bar meeting. And uh, we're going around the room and it came my time and here's this big tooth missing. And I said, and by the way, I don't have to act out today even if my front tooth falls out. (laughs) Okay. Uh, This is a tough topic. I want to bring it to a close. It's a tough topic because for whatever reason, I feel our emphasis has been more on the result of lust rather than the lust. In Nashville, we've been blessed with the realization that lust lives in secrecy and that if I am not totally, totally explicit in every detail when I'm sharing with someone, I'm not going to get that lust out. I can have no holes barred. And people who call me can't have any holes barred. And sometimes I have to put the phone like this. But they need to say it. Every now and then. doesn't happen often. But there are certain things from my life, childhood things, sexual abuse stuff, that I hear it immediately goes to my pelvis. I don't know why. And I just have to go like this. But for the most part, the stuff you think is the worst thing at all possible, I've either done 20 times... Or it's the furthest thing from anything that touches me that has absolutely no connection to me and I don't mind hearing it at all. But as Roy says, the athlete's foot of the brain, it only grows in dark places. It must be brought to the light. It's so important for me to tell you that I still have erotic dreams at times and they pop up, or I still have this delusional thinking, if I don't lead with my weakness, I will leave this place thinking I'm well. And I hope you all get something out of this, but this ain't for you. This is for me. This is how I stay sober. It reminds me how ill I am. And the paradox of the program, we are like men who have lost our legs and can never grow new ones. And yet I have never not only walked better, I'm running, in essence, symbolically. The more I accept I have no legs... (laughs) the better I'm walking. The paradox, the miracle of this program. 
Through surrender we win. By giving it away we keep it. My God, what miraculous issues. By acknowledging our lust, we get rid of it. Wow. And by the way, if God loved me when I was doing all that crap, he must be hog-ass wild about you guys too and gals. Thank you. Thank you.